to our morning show on women, wealth, and social change. We are unpacking trends in philanthropy, things that have not worked in philanthropy, and really the opportunities we have to do philanthropy and impact investing differently and, and really rise to the moment that is today. So we have a very special guest today, Ellen McGirt. Hello, Ellen. Hey, Alix, how are you? I am good. How are you? I am good, I think. You know, that is the hardest question to ask since the pandemic. How are you? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm here. I'm alive. I'm frantic. I'm worried. I'm resigned. I'm all of the things at once. But today, I'm hopeful. Before we dive in, Ellen, tell us just a little bit more about you and, and your journey. Well, oh, that is a big question, isn't it? <laughs> I, I am, well, it intersects with yours and that's why it's such a fun question. I'm, um, I'm an editor at Fortune and um, I'm, a, I'm a writer and I also created a, um, a regular column that I'm really proud of called Race Ahead five years ago, where um, for the first time a major business publication dug into the intersection of race and power and culture and how that impacted the rest of the world. But as I was thinking about that, you know, so much of what I was able to do was because I knew you, Alix. You know, I, I think it's really important that your viewers understand how hard you've been working to understand what extreme poverty is and how it operates in the world and who it benefits. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important piece. So when I met you, it was the first, I, I met you as a, as, a, as a wandering, questing reporter looking to understand how a very specific type of solution, a respectful solution, a market-based solution, a co-created solution was going to help people living in extreme poverty, which I had never experienced before. So what imprinted on me like um, a mama on a baby duck when I went and traveled the world with you in Haiti several times in India, for example, was the idea that people are poor for a reason, mm -hmm. their poverty benefits somebody, that knowledge has to be part of any solution that you create and they must co-create the solution. It was the first, without knowing it, it was the first experience I had of true stakeholder capitalism in action and it changed my life as a, as a journalist. Um, and it certainly changed my life as this person who is in whatever capacity I have, is able to vote on policy, to weigh in on how things should work and be organized. And, you know, it just, the work that we did together, me watching you actually do the work is probably a fairer way of saying it, is um, it changed the way I participate in the world permanently. And so for that, I'm very grateful. I, so thank you, Ellen. And as I said, this is, you know, this is why I want to spend every Monday morning with you. <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome. No, you're awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's I what think, women should do. I know. That's exactly what we should do. We are there for each other, but I just, you know, I, I will add one more thing, which is that, you know, what was so great about you know, having the luxury of having someone like you on this journey is you really brought that to life in the form of storytelling. You know, we met right when I had just recently joined water.org. We were part of this movement that, you know, alongside other social entrepreneurs, were really striving to tell the world that, look, people living in poverty are not a problem to be solved. They are a market to be served. And in the context of water and sanitation, there are millions of people out there who are already paying a very high price for water and would and would absolutely take out a microcredit loan to be able to pay a local water utility to pay for a sustainable water connection in their home, right? Reliable water pipes and toilets that would make sure that they had affordable and more reliable services at home. And so it was really part of this movement of demonstrating that uh, the problem has its own solution, right? Guided by, you know, so much of the, the knowledge from water.org CEO and co-founder Gary White and, and the whole team there and, and really being part of the solution, as you said, 
Ellen, that's driven locally. And so it was, it was great to see you bring that to life in the, in the form of storytelling. And I think now fast forward years later, my goodness, you know, more than a, a decade, right? This idea has, has scaled and, and is being implemented all over the world, but we're still navigating this universe where yeah. philanthropy really hasn't met its full potential. And it's not in the spirit of blaming or shaming. It's just acknowledging that we're not where we could be. And, you know, I've just very actively had that conversation with you. And I think you beautifully said, you know, that philanthropy is going to to have a reckoning, right? We had that conversation with our friend Cindy Jones Nyland. Yes. Where uh, we just interviewed her last week, you know, where we were all acknowledging that 2020 opened up the cracks. And now we have a chance to op- to fill these cracks with something better. And so I'd love your thoughts on this. I mean, what, what would it take to get, and it's a big question, but what would yeah. it take to get philanthropy on a better track. And when I say philanthropy, you know, of course I'm talking about wealth, social change, impact investing. I mean, everything under that, that umbrella, like share with us a little bit your thoughts on that, Ellen. You know, it is, it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about because I, I think it's, I think philanthropy is gonna go through some things, right? Power is gonna go through through some things. You know, I'm seeing it in the C-suite, fortune, obviously, I spend a lot of time thinking about power structures, talking to powerful people, the diversity and inclusion um, conversation now and equity has turned into a conversation about equity. Everybody's going through some things. And that that is the basis of some optimism that I have, that some real change can happen. I think um, there are several ways to, to sort of frame the issue when it comes to philanthropy. One is um, we have overemphasized to the point of fetishization the ability of wealthy people, of rich people, to solve all problems. There's absolutely no reason why a person who got good at software needs to now be weighing in on a school district unfamiliar to them. There's no reason why somebody who created a, a media platform now needs to be responsible for the distribution of vaccines. These are, I'm speaking generally, but obviously there are there are a few people who made an inordinate amount of money for a variety of reasons that have to do more with how capitalism and society works rather than their innate genius. And we need to stop thinking about the amount of money you have in your bank account as a proxy for your ability to do things. Um, What people with a lot of money and power tend to do is continue to amass money and power. It is a stretch to request that somebody do it differently. You know, that you amass all of this and then suddenly you're going to switch your your mindset and give it away. Mm -hmm. Very rare, but we're starting to see that. That's a very interesting way to be a billionaire, isn't it? Unrestricted giving to people who actually do know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see more of that, but it's, it, it is a lot to ask. And I think we should stop asking, you know, I think just leave these, leave these rich, rich people alone. If you want to invest in your alma mater, if you want to invest in a media platform that continues to allow over amplify your voice, you know, I wish you wouldn't do that, but if that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. We need to stop pretending that these people are going to solve our problems for us because they don't understand them. They haven't taken the steps to understand the problems. So for philanthropy to work, it needs to not be about acknowledging the largesse of a very wealthy person. I don't really know how to do that. Um, It has to be about radical collaboration with the people who need the problem solved. That means sharing power with people who are poor, uh, with people who are remote, but with people who have specific expertise into how their world works and finding productive ways of doing that. I, and I think that doesn't come naturally to somebody who has succeeded in the capitalist instinct that makes people very, very wealthy. From an entrepreneurial point of view and from second and third generation family wealth, you're, I don't know if you, if you um, read the, the essay recently, um, 
uh, Miss Disney. Was it in the Atlantic? I think I can't quite no, remember where it not. was. Tell me, yes. But she she talked about what it's like to grow up in a very wealthy family. Mm -hmm. That you are your job is to maintain the wealth. Your job is to preserve the wealth. Um, that is what your job is supposed to do because that is your legacy. And that doesn't lend itself to kinds of creative risk-taking. It doesn't lend itself to radical collaboration at all. It's, right. It is a savings account. You know, it, it is a family savings account attached to your name. And I think that's what we need to do is find ways of pooling actual cash and resources in a structure that everyone can agree on has um, a meaningful opportunity to include the stories and perspectives and the power and the direction of people who did not make that money. And that is that is a very, very hard thing to do. But I've seen it happen. I've seen important initiatives, products and services co-created in a meaningful and respectful way with the people who were not able to bankroll it personally. But right. we can't, we're not going to be able to capitalize. We need to rethink how the capitalist impulse as it is applied to philanthropy, if we're ever going to get anywhere, because at the end of the day, somebody benefits from the poor. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, and it's what where I, I, goodness, there's just so much there, which is not surprising, Ellen, because we need a whole hour, at least two hours, maybe to yeah. have this conversation. I need but three more cups of tea, is what I need. Oh my lord! Three more cups of tea. It goes back to something you shared, you know, when we were all speaking together at the School World Forum, and you said something that was really mm. powerful, which is we just need to understand that our ignorance is actually a strength. So what we mean is we don't know everything. We need to show up in this work, acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, we don't know everything, and truly the answers, the solutions are within the people that we yeah. are striving to help. So instead of celebrating, you know, the the person who is providing all of the funding, I mean, in today's context, we really need to be celebrating the people we're striving to help. You know, in my mind, I was connecting this to another dot, and then I'll circle back on what you just said, which is that, you know, when I think about how the stories of women from emerging markets are reflected in all of this, it's a majority of the time, those stories continue to be reflected through the old lens of philanthropy, which is when you think of women in emerging markets, you think of poverty, you think of challenges, you think of issues that we need to solve versus the success stories. There's actually a lot of women who have found creative ways, you know, to overcome poverty, who are creating their own businesses, who really represent the future of their countries. And where are those stories? Why are we not talking about that. And all of this is reflected in this culture that you're speaking to that we have created. Yep. So how do we create a new culture? Also in a way where, you know, kind of putting my other hat on as someone who was out there, you know, raising funds, I would often tell funders, you're overthinking this. You know, right. we have a solution that's working and it cannot scale without you ceding control and providing significantly more unrestricted philanthropic resources that are going to unlock more from the market and create a sustainable global capital market for water and sanitation in ways in which people living in poverty can participate. But as you rightly said, it's, it's not the only thing we need to unpack here. I mean, power structures really are the, the guiding issue who is making the decisions on how these, um, these resources are spent, who's driving the solutions. And I think taking an approach that you were just speaking about, Ellen, which is creating a pooled structure where from the get-go, how we're gonna use the resources and that pooled capital in those, uh, that capital structure where we're able to use resources in creative ways. If the intention already there is to be innovative to embrace radical collaboration, to support ideas that are really led by the people we're striving to help. Maybe investors are showing up with no expectations of return other than learning something 
and addressing systemic inequalities because guess what we're all going to gain from that yeah, it's probably the right way, um, or I should say a way of approaching this. The challenge, Ellen, and this gets to my other question for you, is that requires massively challenging today's status quo, and the status quo <laughs> doesn't want to be challenged. No, it hates it. That's its job. It's a, you know, you're, you're a third generation wealthy person. Status quo means you have to enter the world in a way you're not prepared for. You want everything to be the same. Power wants everything to be the same and wants to conserve its position in the world. It's the, you know, it's so interesting how you frame this, Alix, it, as always. It, it ends up being an existential conversation, which is not something that anybody prepares for. I was, I was talking, I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival recently and um, the first sort of hybrid out in the world festival. It was an emotional thing to be back out talking to people. And I was um, interviewing Chip Berg, who's one of my favorite CEOs, he's the CEO of Levi's and a real stakeholder oriented person, someone who really has a profound sense of when and how to take risks when you press when you weigh in on pressing social issues and all the work that happens. You have, when you talk, when you, when you think about stakeholders, you have to talk to stakeholders. He has a lot of employees. He has a board he has to think about. He's got customers he has to think about all around the world. It's a supply chain. It's it's all the complications you can Im imagine. And um, the ignorance piece that you mentioned earlier on is, a, is an important part of it because we don't know. There's so much we don't know about what's going to work. Um, and nobody, paid, the remark, the thing, one of the things that we talked about is that nobody pays a CEO not to know. Right. You know, the impulse to know is so profound. It's sort of like baked in. Mm -hmm. So how do you create a culture that learns together? How do you take, create a culture that redefines um, failure in a meaningful way, iteration in a meaningful way? We, you know, in technology, we talk a lot about iteration. I don't think people really mean it. Like they don't really mean it. Um, they, they, you know, this button over here on this website, you know, this this minor um, update in a code over here. That's not actual the iteration that we need to become comfortable with. It's mm -hmm. the it's the up on a high wire without a net feeling thing, but it doesn't have to be to your point that existential, that sense of dread, that mm -hmm. sense of not knowing in public. And I I think that's going to take some some soul searching from an individual level. It's going to take a new type of conversation, consistent conversation from leaders to reassure people that we are trying to create a new muscle. The new muscle is of patience and of, of listening and of collecting data and looking for new metrics of success. The idea that we can link the work that we're doing not only to lives saved, but communities transformed. There's a conversation to be had about um, linking women's well-being to not just GDP, but to cleaner environment, um, climate change mitigation, it gets enormously complicated. But I think if we don't have, if we don't begin to develop collectively a new vocabulary, a new, become new, newly fluent in a way, in a new way of thinking about um, credit, and, and I mean, who gets the credit, who takes the blame? What does it mean to move an idea forward? What does it mean to ask people who actually have expertise and not attach your name to an outcome because you need the credit for it? Suddenly we're, we're having a much different kind of conversation. And I, I have to believe that over time it will make a difference, but it will only make a difference if everybody has a basic sense of what it means to understand the humanity of the person that you're talking to. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very different piece. Um, the I, empathy piece. Yeah. Philanthropy is gonna go through the same things that everybody else is going through right now at a time when the ocean is actually burning, where people took to the streets to ask for and demand racial equity during a global pandemic. It is not gonna stop. So everybody just needs to take a breath, work together and get very smart about understanding what they're actually talking about and how to actually get there. Thank you, Ellen. Wonderful words of insights and advice. I can't wait for you to come back so we can continue our conversation. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. I could talk to you all day long. <laughs>